Hello and welcome back to the F2 show. I'm your host, Fraser Ford, and I'm delighted to say, returning to the show, we have Inside F2 editors, Hannah Pruffett and L.A. Wilshaw, and we also have GP Grandstand's Jim Kimberley. Coming up on today's show, we have the first double winner of the season. We'll be reviewing all of the action from a thrilling weekend of racing in Baku. We'll be looking at how Baku's results impact on the championship standings. And finally, we'll be getting the panel to answer all of your questions off the back of this weekend. But I mean, where do we even start? I love Baku. I said that in the, in the previous show and boy, did it deliver. Uh, so we just race at Baku every week, LA. Oh Yeah, totally. Uh, this track is perfect, isn't it, for um, any race? And I, I just kind of thinking that, you know, that I can't remember the gentleman's name who designs all the tracks, but um, I kind of think that this needs to be looked at even for race tracks at circuits because you know obviously you've not only got that little wiggly section you know around the castle you have turns that people can overtake in for goodness sakes I mean you know what not many other circuits you can do that in and then you've got that fantastic wide section the long section where everyone can get the DRS and you know some tracks can be tricky because different parts of the circuits another driver can get that DRS back but this just seems quite perfect to me and um, I, I'm kind of thinking can you not just reassess Monaco just a little bit and you know is there any more streets you can use or you know just to maybe make it a bit similar and I'm really hopeful with Saudi being a new circuit that they might actually be designing it a little bit like Baku wouldn't that be great? Yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? It's certainly an entertaining race this weekend. And if Saudi is anything like that, I think we'd be very happy. And yeah, another crazy, crazy weekend, Jim, obviously. Um, it's almost difficult to keep up at some points, isn't it? Yeah, I was thinking that uh, myself with some of the races, because I remember trying to go through what happened in each of them. And all of them seemed to be a little bit of fading out a little bit in the last third, maybe, of each of the three races. Race one, people generally trying to keep it quite sensible again with the second reverse grid, unless your name's Dan Tickton when you're going to go racing absolutely bonkers at an Ami Kazi overtook. And then you yeah, the other ones almost blurred into one big crazy event. Uh, and of course, those crazy events are won by a certain Estonian who's really landed this, this weekend with a first double race win of this new format. And Herman Tilke you were thinking of LA with the, the circuit design and yeah I think Yuri Vips will be right behind you signing a petition to say we should have more tracks designed like this if I can race race like this and also a big shout out to Robert Schwartzman it seems so long ago since he won that race and we barely saw him because he checked out up front welcome back to the championship Mr Schwartzman it's good to see you yeah, two strong weekends there. Obviously, Yuri Bips, Robert Schwartzman as well. And Hannah, Formula 2 never fails to disappoint, does it? What a weekend. Absolutely. I think kind of going into the weekend, Formula 2 had obviously provided a lot of excitement at Monaco, probably more than the track maybe justifies in some aspects. But heading into this weekend, we thought it's going to be chaos. And I remember Yuri Vip saying basically that the whole weekend they were expecting absolute chaos from all of the drivers and it didn't disappoint at all. I think that was probably one of the best things about it was every race had something, even though say sprint race one was maybe a little bit quieter because they were obviously thinking of the reverse grid. There was still a lot of action and not just up front, but up and down throughout the midfield and the back and just proves why Formula 2 is probably the best series out there at the moment. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It really, really is. So let's take a look at the championship standings after round three. Guan Yu Zhou has his gap at the top reduced to just five points to Oscar Piastri after a slightly disappointing weekend by the Chinese driver's standards. Robert Schwartzman and Yuri Vips' brilliant weekends, as Jim's just alluded to, have propelled them to third and fourth in the standings and right into championship contention. And Dan Tictum and Teo Porcher, strong weekend for Dan Tictum. Uh, so they round up the top six. And the team standings, we have new leaders at the top of the team standings in Prima, who have leapfrogged you and I virtuosi to the top spot. High Tech and Carlin are level on points ahead of ART and Campos, who round out the top six. If you want to see all of the full race results and standings, you can head over to our website, www.insidef2.com, and you can find everything you need there. Now, only one place to start, and that's with our first double winner of the season, Yuri Vips. Two pretty incredible victories, Hannah. 
completely. I have to admit, heading into the weekend, I felt very bad for him because obviously round one had not gone to plan at all. Round two, he obviously had the podium courtesy of Liam Lawson's disqualification. But I thought if I was just waiting for him to be able to get his championship campaign started because I kind of fancied him as a championship contender from the get-go. And he certainly delivered. I think it proved why Red Bull's faith in him is so justified. I think you couldn't fault him. The only thing he made, I think the only thing he kind of identified as a fault was that he didn't get pole in qualifying. But quite frankly, I don't think any of us could turn around and be like, you should have done a bit better there. I think the two incredible victories highlighted two kind of slightly different strategies. The fact is obviously in sprint race two, started third, had to kind of play the slightly longer game, eventually fight his way through from Viscal and Beckman, both of whom I have to say put up very solid defences, even though the cars were maybe out of place to where they would normally be. And then obviously in the second feature race was took control from the start, overtook Lawson and kept a cool head because even though obviously Lawson ended up getting the penalty and Piastri had his penalty, Piastri at one point was catching on him and Vips just seemed to take a sensible approach when he realised the gap was reducing. He just extended it again and just completely dominated that race. I don't think anyone could take anything away from him. And if I was Yuri Vips, I would be wanting every race to be like Baku because if he races like this for the rest of the season, he's most certainly going to be a high championship contender. Yeah, he really is. Jim, is he a championship contender? And, you know, what, what are his chances? Can he push on for the rest of the season from this? It's difficult to say that he's not a championship contender. I think the real key thing is he could already be up there, maybe even the lead of the championship, if not for some of these, and I'm sure we'll talk about the stewards this race as well, but some of these decisions, these odd decisions that we've seen in both rounds or through all the rounds so far with high tech just seem to be under investigation in, in perpetuity where they've got either an investigation before the race, after the race, something to screw them up. And then when they don't, and even then I'm just thinking Lawson with his, <laughs> his problems as well, but when Vips doesn't, yeah, two race wins and high tech looking like a team that, They've already got a win from earlier in the season with Lawson. They've essentially got another win at Monaco with Lawson that was taken away from them. Kramer are meant to be the team that everyone was expecting to go in. And now you rightly say that they've jumped uh, jumped you and I virtuosi in the championship standings. But high tech, don't rule them out. If they can power Vips to these sorts of performances and getting one, two qualifying positions like they did. And I just looked at the times then. Vips was only a tenth and a half off Lawson. So he's been a bit harsh on himself getting a P2 start and still being disappointed. But yeah, it would have been a perfect weekend otherwise. Didn't really make a difference in the end. But if high tech can get those sorts of qualifying positions when qualifying is so vitally important this season with the reverse grids that we're going to get, I don't see any reason why Vips isn't going to be a championship contender. And I'd argue right now he could be the strongest Red Bull Junior driver we've got. Lawson, very impressive too. I'm not going to write him off. But yeah, I think Vips really has arrived properly in his first full season this weekend. Yeah, a great weekend from him. LA, let's talk about Liam Lawson. Obviously a bit of a mixed weekend. He had pole position. Uh, he had a frustrating race one. He'll probably be a little bit uh, disappointed with that. Uh, but then great race, uh, great pace in sprint race two uh, and then a 10 second time penalty in a feature race really kind of ruined his chances didn't it yeah he definitely did have a mixed weekend even in practice he was down in 11th and I know practice isn't exactly representational of, of what the driver or the car can do but you know it was still there it was still p11 and yeah he qualified on pole which was amazing um and you know he did well obviously uh, at the beginning of the season so it wasn't unexpected um and he, he sort of said comments of this race being there's potential to pass um you know he just wants to survive the weekend and gain as many points as possible so we obviously had his sensible head on as well which was fantastic because it probably what calmed him down a little bit for the races yeah um and then he got the 10 second penalty of course as you've just mentioned uh with the incident with Pusher, which was obviously a bit of a shame because I, I don't know i don't know if you're going to ask me about it but 
think some can you not sometimes put this down to dry to a racing incident rather than something deliberate because you know I kind of think penalties should be given for deliberate moves that's that's to take somebody else out um so you can benefit and I kind of feel that that incident was maybe more of a racing incident um but I'm not you know I'm sure we might cover that a little bit later on I'm not I, I don't know um but yeah so you know obviously um yeah, you say it's mixed, isn't it? For the poor, poor boy. But that's look, I can mention it every time I'm on here with you. These feeder series are to develop these drivers into potential Formula One drivers. And of course, they want to get as many trophies as they can, as many wins as they can, and the teams do too. But this is incredible training ground for these guys because this is what's going to happen in Formula One if they get there. And it's exactly what happened today in that Formula One race, if, if you know any of you guys watched that. So it's good preparation. Yeah, let's talk about it now. Jim, harsh for that 10-second penalty, or do we think that's justified? I don't agree with LA that it was necessarily a racing incident. It was, I wouldn't say it's premeditated in the way that I'm really going to try and chop this guy off, but it was a very aggressive move. And I would question if the name wasn't Liam Lawson and was maybe somebody who's got a reputation like Tictum or Mazepin in F1, who's got a bit of that bad boy attitude, if fans would be a little bit less sympathetic about a 10 second penalty, but 10 seconds is very, very, very harsh. We saw Drogovic with a 10 second penalty from, was it race one, when he uh, took Piastri and Lawson, uh, ironically, out of the out of the race and then Tictum with a 10 second penalty for another lap one incident as well. So there's some consistency with the stewards being harsh this weekend on lap one instance but i know that there's been discussion about being a bit more lenient on lap one uh, incidents collisions whatever because it is racing people are jostling for position and i know lawson was a bit surprised like what for or why is it why is it 10 seconds five seconds a penalty yeah i i think we spoke about it after the race briefly fraser as well about was it too harsh? I, and I really can't, I can't tell what the best thing for the stewards to do here because talking to the drivers after the race is like a slap on the wrist. But we are dealing with super powerful cars here. And if Porsche wasn't as quick to react or if being a bit offline like he was because he had to go over onto the pit exit, if he put his foot down at the wrong place or there's dust or there's debris, that could have been a really bad accident. accident. So... It's a proving ground. Louis is completely right. This is where these drivers are learning. And part of that learning process might be the stewards being harsh disciplinarians to tell them off and say, okay, this is over the line, over the pit exit line in this case. And you can't do those sorts of moves. Unfortunate, yes. But if he hadn't shot poor share off that, it might be better for him. He might have lost the position and regained it with that long run up to turn three so the stewards are right to discipline him 10 seconds maybe a bit harsh but you can be rest assured he's not going to do it again yeah he definitely won't and as you say it was a, a busy weekend for the stewards again as in monaco as well la another man who had a penalty kind of harm his feature race was obviously oscar piastri uh, a bit of a mixed weekend uh, a strong feature race uh Probably not going to be overly happy uh, in sprint race one, obviously, where he was taken out. But points gained on championship leader Guan Yu Zhou. Will he come away from Baku happy? Um, yeah, I, I kind of feel he will in general because it's that much of an accident prone circuit where I think every driver kind of thinks it's not going to be me that's involved. But we know from the last time there was a race there um, that there were only 13 finishers, you know, in both of, of both of the races. So um, I, I feel that he will, because at one point he did slip down, didn't he, uh, during the weekend? But he's gained that second place back now in the driver's standings. Um, he's on 73 points. And because of Joe's weekend, then uh, he's only five points now behind behind the, the, the leader. And as we've seen even from last season, you don't necessarily have to be leading this championship all the way through to, to win it. So, um, you know, from comments in press conferences and interviews, I'm sure there's always there's a distant look of the championship. It's always there. Of course, it, of course it is. 
but um, for this weekend, you know, it's I think it's tied nicely in a, a neat little box. You know, at the end of the day, there was the contact. He had to retire, um, which was unfortunate. But I think if he looks back at that sprint race too, where he started in P19 and he finished in P8, um, a little switch, P7, P8, I don't see why he can't be happy with that. Yeah, I mean, he he will be probably a little bit frustrated, won't he? But overall, I think that's a, a good weekend for him. Another person who had a good weekend, Robert Schwartzman. Uh, as you've already said, Jim, you know, his best weekend in Formula 2 this season uh, by, by a long stretch. Uh, he's catapulted himself into championship contention. He's right in the thick of things now, Hannah, isn't he? Absolutely. I think if probably of all the drivers this weekend, if you're Robert Schwartzman, you're leaving there, probably with just as big as a grin as Yuri Vips has, because I think he has found the magic word in Formula 2 this year, which is consistent. Well, consistency is key, ultimately, I think, with having the three-race format. Whereas previous years, most drivers, you would be less prepared to have a bad race. Ultimately, with the reverse grid format, one of your races is going to be the sacrificial lamb. But yet for Schwarzman this weekend, it wasn't. It's, he obviously had sprint race one, one in a lights to flag victory, can't fall in full. He managed to keep a very cool head and measured performance. And I think he deserved it after having a bit of a topsy turvy time at the start of the season. Sprint race two, finished fifth, and then third in the feature race, up from 10th, with some, I have to say, pretty stellar overtakes. I've got to, got to give my hand to him because we obviously saw around that circuit. It was a lot of drivers, when they were trying to fight each other, had difficulties obviously ending up in the wall by themselves or having other cars end up there. But Schwartzman managed to make it stick and thought he's worked the third. The only kind of negative thing for him and the thing that he ultimately needs to address if he wants to continue his championship campaign is his qualifying. It's not the best. It's not brilliant and it's not awful. But I think if he he shouldn't have qualified down in P10, he should have been further up the grid in those to head into the sprint race one. But ultimately, if I'm him, I'd be leaving there pretty pleased because I don't even think he maybe thought with his poor run of luck, whether he would still be a championship contender. And I think it proved after Monaco was maybe that sense of the long game. Now you can see it in some of the drivers, especially in the press conferences, is how they're kind of thinking of the championship, even when they're saying they're not maybe being a bit more reserved when they're fighting for positions. So ultimately, if I'm Schwartzman, I believe they're very happy because of all the drivers this weekend. He's probably, ha- I think, probably of everyone he's had the most consistent weekend other than maybe Vips. Is this a game-changing weekend for Robert Schwartzman? Is he now going to have the confidence to, to really push on and really put a championship campaign together now? Yeah, I'd say so. I think it's, it is a hard one because obviously we are heading to fourth round. We'll be over halfway through the championship by the end of Silverstone. And I think it is difficult for them to think, oh, when is that get-up-and-go finally going to arrive? And I think for him, this has given him the momentum. Silverstone has obviously been a difficult track for him in the past. And I have to admit, I'd be a little bit nervous going there because it obviously didn't go so well last time. It kind of undid his championship campaign. But this time around, he kind of has, I'd say, dealt with probably the low point of his campaign now. And I'd rather get that bad luck out of the way and head into the campaign knowing, right, I've got this car. It's very strong. Him and Oscar Piastri are doing a brilliant job at Prima. No wonder they're leading the team's championship because they are the two most consistent drivers on that grid. And I think for him, Seeing the, I think having Oscar as a teammate, he's had obviously Mick Schumacher last year and Oscar Piastri this year. He's had two very strong teammates in different areas, and it's ultimately helped push them and the team forward. So if I was him, I'd be thinking, right, this championship's underway, and obviously with silly season and the rumor mill starting to kick off around F1 seats, he knows he can't wait until that season finale in Abu Dhabi. He needs to be performing now if he wants to get a seat. Yeah, coming into form at the right time, isn't he? And LA, I said about Dan Tixon in, when we were looking at the, the championship, I said good weekend. I think for his standards, or, or his what he would perceive to be a good weekend, he probably wouldn't be happy with it. But I mean, he showed amazing pace, didn't he? I mean, he, you know, from facing the wrong way in the runoff area uh, in, uh, was it sprint race two, wasn't it? Uh, obviously, Phil is back uh, his way back to P6, uh, last on the road from P8, uh, sorry, up to P8 as well in, 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 in the feature race. Two pit stops, a 10 second time penalty, and he still managed to get up to P8. The, the, the pace was there, wasn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I'll agree with you with with him probably feeling uh, like it wasn't a great weekend. You know, he did um, say after sprint race one, um, he was disappointed. Uh, he said it over the radio. Um, I did as good as it could have been. Um, and that's that's excellent. That's what you want from a racing driver. You want him to be disappointed with P2 because you want your driver to want to win the races. Um, and somebody like Lewis Hamilton would emanate the same thing. You know, he would be disappointed with P2. He wants to win that trophy and be on the top step. Um, so I, I, I thought he was marvellous uh, this weekend. He was brave on the brakes the whole weekend. Those brakes were glowing throughout some of the races that the commentators were noticing. He was doing double overtakes all over the place. Um, a lot of confidence, very Max Verstappen this weekend, in my view. You know, I'm coming through, guys. You know, I'm, I'm racing. I'm a racing driver. And you know what? I'm coming through. Let me through. Uh, fastest laps all over the place, whether it was at the back, at the front, he was a man on a mission he was half a second quicker on lap 11 uh, in sprint race one and where was it in the feature race um he took 2.7 seconds out of beckman at one point and this this guy was on fire i wish the camera had kept going to him to be honest and, and kept on him throughout the races um he was incredibly angry and and frustrated over the radio regarding the incident in the feature race whatever your point of view is of that he says he went for the gap which is again what a driver should do um he th he said that the pace was obscene and uh, that he could have won that race that feature race um today and it, later afterwards on social media you know he apologized for any language might have offended and he said um you know this is this is his last year uh, to get to f1 oh that that's what he thinks at the moment and um how did he put it he said take a step back and understand and realize the pressure that we're all going through and I, I liked that from him because previously he may not have been that gracious or generous with words and yeah he's angry yeah he's passionate why shouldn't he be you know he's a racing driver he wants to win and I still saw the grace afterwards and whether he's had coaching, training, whether he's just maturing as, as a man, I don't know what it is. But I think anybody in F1 looking at him at the moment will see somebody with amazing potential that perhaps just needs a little bit of coaching in a couple of areas. And that's certainly not his driving skill by any means. So anything else can be worked on. Driving skill, he's a world champion. Big words from LA, world champion. There you go. Um, obviously, those double overtakes were, were unbelievable, weren't they? But let's talk about that incident. Were Was that a step too far to go down the inside of Porsche and Armstrong? Was it a little bit, not too far, but amb overly ambitious, should we say? Um, and um, and was was a 10-second, I'll ask you the same question, Jim, was it was a 10-second penalty a little bit harsh on Dan Tictum, um, or was it just a racing incident? One of these weird ones, these incidents with the 10-second penalties, because... In Tictum's case and in Drogovic's case in the first race, I don't think they're penalising the driver in the same way they did with Lawson, as in I don't do this again. It's that they effectively ruined other drivers' races, so there needs to be a penalty, and unfortunately there's no way to recover the time or to un-DNF Lawson, as in Drogovic's case. Um, and then, yeah, Tictum... It was Armstrong, I think, who was on the outside and the unfortunate uh, person who, once again, I think those two corners, turn three and four, Armstrong retired to both of them on the outside. He's really, really struggled this weekend again. Uh, he can't un-DNF himself to recover. So it's like they have to penalise a driver who caused it, but you can't really recover for the drivers who suffered. So... Ambitious, yes, and I totally agree with LA that you want a driver like that who wants to be overly ambitious and wants to try and get those places. And in all fairness, if I was Dan Tictum taking some of those places like I was on Sprint Race 1, I'd be thinking, yeah, this is, this is my weekend. I can make these moves stick. There's maybe that level of maturity, but it's not the right word. There's, there's a level of overconfidence maybe in that race maybe buoyed by that earlier success to think I can make this move stick but it's it's not like 
the other cars are going to jump out of the way for him. And if you're on the inside on a right angle corner on a street track, that's going to be a really difficult position. You're either going to get your front wing taken out or you're going to take somebody else out. And he was lucky that he didn't get more damage than he did. So, yeah, 10 seconds. I don't know what else you can do. What else can you do in this? Are you going to give 10 seconds back to Armstrong in a, diff in a different race? It's, that's not how it works. So I agree that he got the penalty. And like I said in my earlier answer, he's been his penalty was consistent with other penalties that we saw for similar, similar incidents. What was great for us, though, was to see this awesome fight back from, <laughs> from him through the grid to was eighth place in the end and crucially just behind Deruvula in the sister Carlin, who despite another podium, didn't really exhibit the strength of the person who's been at the team longer as Tickton did because he, I think Tickton finished two seconds behind him in that feature race, despite having two pit stops in it and this penalty. And, Tickton really, really, I think I said it in Monaco as well, Tickton really impressed me this weekend. He's, I don't know about the world champion element uh, from LA, but I could certainly see him as a Formula One driver. And then who knows? I don't know any of these guys currently in it, any of these drivers who I'd say they're definite world champion in the future. But I could say on five fingers, which ones I'd say should be in F1 this year or next year. Tictum's definitely one of them. And I don't think I'd have been saying that before the season started. His pace has been, as he said, obscene, almost like his language on the, uh, <laughs> the entry into the pits after the race. I did love, I did feel for his um, his race engineer, just constantly saying, we'll talk about it in the pits. Just just stop talking. No, no, we're going to talk about it in the pits. Oh, it was, <laughs> it was a Dan Tictum comedy radio show, which we all love. And it was a bit extra of it. I, yeah, well done, TikTok on all accounts. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like though he's having he's kind of having his own conversation in the car uh, with himself, and um, you know he, he gets angry. Um, it was the sprint race too, you know, and it's just annoying. Why me, you know? <laughs> and um, and then, but then he like had this. It was almost like he switched, and he sort of said. Um, well, it is, it is what it is. And, you know, we're still going and I'm still in the race. And he's pep talking himself, which was excellent. Um, and that's what, what I kind of meant before about I feel that this is just a slight new maturity to him. Um, the radio comms can easily, you know, be sorted at the end of the day. But you, you're right, Jim, about seeing just a handful of guys that could be in Formula One right now. And I don't think I wouldn't agree that Dan's uh, being noticed for all the wrong reasons by any means um, but but he's noticeable and he's very very present and you know this is what Formula One is looking for and it's what Formula One needs they don't need people that are just floating around in the midfield you know regardless and we all know that it's not necessarily the, the championship winner of F2 that that goes up to Formula One it's the ones that can win races and keep cars on tracks in Formula One and can be right down at P17, P14, and end up finishing P8. And he also has that bit of character to go with it as well, which I think the Formula One teams would love, wouldn't they? So never change Dan Tictum, never change. And also a quick word also for Terra Porcher as well, obviously uh, a fractured arm, I think it is, from, from, from that incident. So we're, yeah, wishing, wishing him all the best, speedy recovery, and hopefully he'll be back with us in Silverstone. Uh, Hannah, I want to talk to you about Guan Yu Zhou. Uh, a strong sprint race won, but then he, he has lost ground in the race in the championship, has not he? Uh, is he going to be feeling the pressure going into Silverstone? I think so. It, it's a difficult one because I feel like going, oh, he didn't really have a very good weekend, but he finished third in sprint race one. Feels a little bit harsh, but it's... It was that difficult thing. I think this is probably the first time I've seen chinks in his armour. I would say Sprint Race 1 was a fairly solid showing. I would say, oh, what was that? Sprint Race 2, obviously, he appeared to have very bad luck in getting, was it the throttle that got stuck down in the end? And obviously, spinning down, ticked into the wall, which he owned up to on social media. And you, in that situation, you just have to go, lady looks on my side, let's move on. But in the feature race, he just seemed off the pace completely. I think that was the strange thing. And on the radio as well, especially his communication with the engineer, he seemed very nervous, very anxious. And even his engineer was like, just get on with it. And I think that's maybe 
where you can start to see the pressure maybe building on these drivers. I think he knows ultimately he's actually probably in the worst position of everyone. He's the championship leader. He's the one everybody wants to beat. And who's in second place? Oscar Piastri, the guy in the same junior programme as him. If it was Dan Tatum in second or Robert Schwartzman, he wouldn't be great, but I think he would probably be feeling, okay, I'm the top Alpine driver. He also does have the fact that this is his third season in the championship. Even if he does win, there is an element of Formula 1 teams maybe going, A, where there's a space for him, because we don't obviously know what will happen with Alpine, but also... If Oscar Piastri is finishing narrowly second to him in the championship on his first go, do we take him over Joe? But I think overall for the weekend, he'll be feeling the pressure heading into the Silverstone. I wouldn't blame him if he was incredibly nervous about it because we've seen, look what happened with Schwartz from last year, look at what happened with Callum Eilat. He knows, especially having been Eilat's teammate last year, how easily a championship can disintegrate in front of your eyes if you're not consistent. And I think that is the fundamental thing for him and so many of those other drivers is they can't afford to be having races now where they are off the pace. Okay, getting involved in incidents where it's not their fault or having a throttle retirement, you can't help it. But if you are seriously off that pace, it creates, I think, an instability because it doubt it makes you doubt whether you're understanding your car properly. And I think for him, he'll be feeling that Baku was maybe a series of missed opportunities and he'll be hoping that Silverstone isn't the same because if he goes into Silverstone and has a similar put checkered performance you'll lose the momentum that he's gained at the start yeah he was a, he was a second off the pace at was behind Felipe Drogovic his teammate obviously in the same car at one point is he is he gonna is he gonna lose a bit of confidence from that LA is that something that um you know he'll forget and, and say he's had a good season so far he's top of the championship and, and bounce back in Silverstone well I hope so because as Hannah just referenced there, there seems to be something a little bit off with him in in the you know feature race and um there was a bit of radio comms that actually felt a bit awkward um to listen to and um and I, I can't I don't really want I don't want to laugh at that because you know I, I think that was quite a serious moment that's quite a defining moment for his season and he can I think he can only go one way or the other and hopefully it's not backwards um you know he will Every driver has to reassess the race, whether they win it or whether they lose it or they lose out. And, um, you know, he's going to have a serious sit down with the team that he has around him, you know, whoever that may consist of. And I don't mean necessarily the racing team. I mean, uh, the personal team that he, that he has, the coaching team um, to, you know, have a little bit of a, a word and straighten up. It's possibly the pressure. It's possibly the seeing his, his points not increasing this weekend and you do have these hot rookies you know on your trail um coming up and you do have your damn tictums that are being pushed back pushed back pushed back but your damn tictums are pushing back forward you know and and there's joe not being able to cope with that um because dan you know took, took a position off him as well so um hopefully hopefully he'll come back because he's he's a he's a good driver I say with this, uh, it's difficult to know what went wrong because he clearly showed pace, didn't he, in that first race? He had, didn't seem at any point to be under threat of not getting that podium, from what I recall. And I don't know, they had the car overnight. So I just don't know if there's something wrong with that throttle pedal after they had to maybe do some sort of repairs after sprint race two, because I can understand why he was so frustrated on the radio because. Yeah, he qualified, was it P8 or lower down? He wasn't going to be going for pole position, but the high techs that they had that wrapped up. But how do you lose so much pace over the course of 24 hours? And if he hadn't had that throttle issue, which wasn't his fault, he might have gained fifth place or something in sprint race two, and we would be having a completely different conversation now. So I can understand it that why am I going so slow? I don't understand. I wasn't going this slow before, and now I'm going slow. The, the track was different, of course, on Sunday. It had no sunshine. It was all clouded over. Maybe the track temperature really made his tyres struggle to, to heat up. But if I was Joe, I understood. And I completely agree, LA. The, the, those radio messages were more cringeworthy and embarrassing than Tictums because I felt like I was in Joe's shoes and getting the hurry up 
but I'm like, I don't know how to hurry up. I'm just doing what I was doing <laughs> before on Saturday and now it's not working, but maybe that's adaptability. But a brief word as well, just because I love this Alpine ongoing saga, especially at the top of the championship, but down in the championship, poor Christian Lundgaard. I'm going to put a big, big say now. He's out of the championship. Yeah, it's, it's certainly looking that way, isn't it? Because he's really, really struggled. And, you know, obviously unlucky in Monaco with that with that engine failure. But other than that, he, he's, he's really struggled, isn't he? He's really struggled. And we know that he has the talent. He hasn't lost the talent since last season, has he? No, he hasn't lost the talent. And he was very unlucky uh, at Monaco. That engine issue, not his fault. But of all the driver programmes, because I could imagine... Who knows what's going to happen with Gasly next year? Red Bull might think, we'll give you another chance. This pair of guys, nothing to us, get rid of him. That'd be a bit harsh, but seeing how he did this weekend. But that seeing Helmut Marco congratulating Vips, Marco's going to remember these sorts of things. He had the same thing with Lawson, that there's a lot of potential drivers. And we know Red Bull just put them through. And if you're not good enough, out you go. Ask Alex Albon. So those Red Bull drivers... I can imagine any of them could be in Formula One next year. I don't know how it's all going to shake out in Alpha Tauri and Red Bull. The Al- then, then Ferrari, Raikkonen, maybe his last season. And then you go and put in an Eilot or a Schwartzman, probably not an Armstrong at this rate, into that seat. Um, but the Alpine is the big one for me because as it currently stands, it looks like it could be one of those two drivers making the step up into F1 next year or at least winning the championship and therefore should be taking a step up. But Lundgaard isn't one of them. And what happens to him after this season, should it continue on this trajectory? Alpine will drop in, I presume. And where next? Yeah, a difficult situation for him. Hopefully he can turn his season around. And Jim, I'm going to stay with you because I know you're chomping at the bit to talk about Ralph Boschong. Uh, His performances probably went a little bit under the radar this weekend, didn't they? But another really solid weekend. Yeah, uh, I I worried, for the wrong word, but I worried that the Monaco races were an element of him being on a track where it's so difficult to overtake that, yeah, I can qualify well and lock myself in P5 and I'll finish in P5, even if I'm slow. And I remember that he wasn't exactly hassling the cars in front of him, but even if he was, what's he going to do at Monaco? This time round, though, this is a track where you can pass and people were passing. And yeah, in all fairness, he did get overtaken a couple of times, but it wasn't like he was sliding down the order from, you know, high scoring points positions down to nowhere the campos i don't know how strong it actually is and nanini back and he wasn't setting the world on fire but we had boshong just there in the very like you say under the radar position the cameras weren't focusing on him because he wasn't doing much in the way of overtaking he was just solidly going about his business quietly under the radar and he Unlike De Ruvula, who I don't want to be picking on in this, but I did see him falling back in what I thought was a stronger car in the car lane, especially considering how Tickton was. And you know, we've spoken more in peace about Tickton now and how well he had the weekend. The car lane's quick, and I don't think the Campos is as quick as the car lane, but Ralph was still there nonetheless. And I think it's kind of obvious I've got the soft spot for him because he's coming in from this businessman background or businessman acting background of having to try and get the sponsorship and fight his way in there and having been dropped or falling out before because of sponsorship reasons that this is like, you talk about Tictum's last chance. We've not got Ralphie without any one backing him from a Formula One point of view. He's just there on potentially a swan song of like, look at me guys. I was always all right. And now I'm potentially going to get a podium if he continues this. He's just been a street circuit king. So, yeah, really, really, really happy for him. Um, I think he got P5, P6 this weekend. He got P4 at Monaco last time. So if you're talking about perfect drives without pushing for a win, yeah, Ralph Bashong is deserving of a round of applause. (laughs) <laughs> no, he had a really strong weekend, didn't he? Two, two strong races there. What is, uh, Jim, I'll stick with you. What, what are the benefits of being part of a driver academy? And is, for example, Ralph Bosham, where he's not attached to a driving academy, can that be a benefit? And can that really, you know, you, you haven't got any pressure on you. You're just going out and driving for yourself, really, aren't you? 
you don't have pressure on you in some regards, but you've also got the pressure then, not this season for him, maybe that's showing. But you don't, you've got the pressure of how am I going to fund this because it's not a cheap sport at all, which I'd argue, you know, with the talent I've got behind a Formula One car, according to F1 2021, that might be uh, why I'm not there. But in all seriousness, Red Bull, for all their foibles and um, for how much we might want to crap on them a little bit, if you excuse my French, that they put the drivers in and out, but they put drivers through and they give opportunities to so many more drivers who may never have had opportunities. I looked at the grid earlier on F1, I think six or seven drivers all had some sort of affiliation at some point. And you know, Sebastian Vettel, he was, I looked at the podium, in fact, that was the what top I three, about. yeah, the top three. Perez, not from... Um, his junior days in the same way but all the drivers had some sort of Red Bull partnership so if it wasn't for them we might not have had a Ricardo we might not have had a Sainz and you know, they are almost furniture in F1 at this point so they, the driver academies do make a huge difference in terms of drivers who may not otherwise have the opportunity to get in those places so I don't know if Drogovic for example, who's talented enough. I don't know if he's talented enough for F1. Right now, he's had a bit of a topsy-turvy season, but he's certainly a race winner. He's certainly great in F2 and might have been a bit of bad luck with some of these unlucky errors he's had on the first laps in particular. But he is spending, his family is spending a lot of money to keep him in F2. So that's pressure because that's something he probably knows. If I don't do this year, I can't afford it for next year. Whereas... We mentioned Lundgaard, so I'm not going to jump on that. But Piastri, for example, say his season takes a downward slide now, he doesn't have to worry of that same can I afford it next year because more than likely Alpine will want to keep him and help fund that. Then you've also got the element with Ferrari, which is why we don't have Eilot in it now, who want to have money for you to be in it, but then it does open opportunities. So should COVID strike badly now and we had a Leclerc or somebody out of a race, Ilock could step in and that's an opportunity because of the Ferrari backing. So he's paid his way to kind of get there, but he's clearly got the talent and it also opens some doors in order to maybe get the virtuosi drive, which maybe he wouldn't have got off away. So there's, there's no proper answer. Financially, great, obvious, it's going to help you. Pressure-wise then, you know, you've got Helmut Marker who's going to be looking uh, down at you if you if you don't deliver the results. But if you don't deliver the results and you're not in a driver academy, then no one's going to pay attention to you. You're not going to get a sponsorship. So it's a funny old world. I just wish more drivers who weren't affiliated with an, a driver program would have opportunities to get into F1 outside of the financial route like we've seen with, with really Latifi and Mazepin. It's a... Uh, it's the same old problem, but there's not enough seats. Mm. And LA, someone that does have a link with a, uh, an academy, Marcus Armstrong, uh, obviously uh, he had a much better weekend this weekend, didn't he? He was fighting at the front in all three races, probably unfortunate to, to be taken out of sprint race two and then the feature race as well. It's, 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 it's better from, isn't it? It was, a, it was a much better weekend than what we've had previously. Um, I don't know. <laughs> you know, look, the guy's got five retirements out of nine races, um, you know, and this weekend he finished the seventh in sprint race one and the last two races are retirements. And yes, you can argue that he was punted off, you know, into walls. But there's then the, I might sound a bit harsh now, and I'm so sorry, Marcus, I don't mean it in this way, but there's also the, the sort of general rule of, well, qualify better, so you're further up you know that you're out of trouble because I kind of think at circuits like this like street circuits tricky circuits if you're right at the front first couple of rows or if you're at the back last couple of rows you'll probably sort of be okay-ish on starts restarts but if you're somehow around that midfield pack you're going to get in trouble you really are so qualify better and then you're not going to be punted off into a wall um and and that's that sounds harsh and i'm so sorry or qualify um, worse from your words here la qualify at the back <laughs> yeah qualify at the back yeah why not you know um i mean you know he did i mean in practice he was sixth he qualified in sixth 
you know, which, which qualification is fantastic. Um, and, and he does seem to do sort of well pre races, but then once he gets into the races, things go not very well for him and I don't quite know what's happening even last season I had very high hopes for him last season I think he started off quite well if I, if I can remember rightly um but you know sort of petered off um and he, he seems to be not even getting a bit of a start to me this season which is a shame because he's backed by the Ferrari Driver Academy obviously one of one of the best if not the best driver academies arguably um in Formula 2 and so we you know why is he not doing better that's the question I think we need to ask. We don't know the answer. We can only sit here and speculate. But why is he not doing better? He, you know, he's in a dance car and um, he's got Ferrari Driver Academy backing him with all that expertise, you know, right next to right next to Ferrari in Italy. And um, it's just such a shame for him because I did have high hopes. So I don't know. Sorry if I sound harsh, but qualify better. I don't know if I sound harsh here, and maybe one of you guys might be able to correct me with some extra knowledge that I don't have, but dams just seem to be fairly disappointing. I know we've got Nisani with his podium at Monaco, but dams are meant to be one of the bigger teams in Formula 2, right? So they haven't turned up. No, I, I, I don't think they've, sorry, I don't think they've, put, I don't know. I don't know what's going on at dams. I don't I was, know. I was going to say, well, if you look at the team's championship, they're ninth. Sharugs are about pace them. MP Campos, I think it's that difficult thing is the Dams car isn't as good as it was last year. But also, I would say, I do seriously wonder did Marcus Armstrong smash a load of mirrors or walk through a load of cracks in the paper <laughs> before he got to the season? Because he hasn't, he's more unlucky than Vips and Schwartzman have been. I think there is the element of obviously, yes, qualify better. If you qualify better and you get taken out, there can be the element of sometimes, oh, it's not your fault accidents happen but in this situation he qualifies poorly the races happen and then just silly things like either sliding into walls or getting clipped the incident that obviously it happened today wasn't his fault I think in that situation he was kind of it was either going to be ticked and clips poor share into him or poor share was going to clip Armstrong going into that corner it was going into the kink it was going to happen inevitably but Armstrong has that also difficult situation of He's got stiff competition. I think last year he was saved in the Ferrari programme because he was better than Alessi was. But this year he's the lowest performing Ferrari junior. You've obviously got um, Arthur Fleur in F3 this year and you've got a couple of highly rated talented juniors and you've got the bottleneck at the top with obviously Eilat being the second reserve driver at Alfa Romeo, so Schumacher as well. Schwartzman, if his championship goes well, he could be in that F1 seat and I think Armstrong is just, unfortunately... Right place, wrong time, too many. Ultimately, there's so many talented drivers on the grid this year, and the same as last year, is he's just found himself being knocked further back. And when things aren't going his way, is ultimately they just seem to compound on him. And I think it's it's a it's gonna be frustrating for him because he should be in this title battle. But I would say, same as Jim said about Lungard, I think Armstrong's out of it now. I genuinely he would need, I don't know. Mick Schumacher 2018 F3 campaign where he sweeps the back end of the championship kind of season because, to be honest, I just can't see him even maybe cracking the top 10 at this point. Do you think it's a case of um, he's, he's too nice, nice guy like Alex Albon? Yeah. And, you know, if, if he actually got a bit of anger underneath him and a bit of determination, you know, like you say, we've, we've done War and Peace on, on Dan, but to get a, get a fire... Lit, lit underneath him because he, he is such a lovely fun gentle character it seems so where's the fire you know light that fire and and be angry it's know? those broken mirrors I think I think Anna has it actually right because if you look at he, you say the fire and the anger he had a little bit of that at sprint race one in Monaco because he gave us the only overtake of that race and that overtake came because he sniffed out this is reverse grid pole and then he couldn't start the race so that's that's i don't know just having an entire um collection of black cats crossing in front of you and walking under every ladder that you can find sort of luck 
I mean, we can't so, forget he's got a P5, you know, in uh, Bahrain. You know, he does have a good, he does have a good finishing position in all of this uh, P5 and then the P7 this weekend. But as I started saying, you know, it's five retirements out of nine races, so it, it, it's something needs to be looked at. Yeah, I mean, he definitely has a bit of faith. If you look at his latest social media post, he definitely didn't think it was it was him at fault for uh, for the, the crash today. So uh, I think he'll yeah feel harsh, harsh, hardly done. But uh, there you go. Uh, and David Beckman, uh, someone we haven't really spoken about on the show actually at all this season. Um, two, uh, sorry, a podium in sprint race two, Hannah. I, you know, a good weekend overall for him, really. Completely, I think. David Beckham's one of the ones that's flew under the radar. I think he obviously wasn't kind of one of the big names coming up from F3 last year. I think he was kind of naturally eclipsed by people like Lawson and people like Piastri and Porsche. But you have to admit, that Sharif's car is not the greatest car on that grid. It's not going to be fighting for wins. It's not going to be a championship contender. But when he's had that car, he's done solid jobs with it. If you look, he's got... He's above Armstrong, he's above Lundgaard, he's got more podiums than Boschong has, even though he's below him in the championship. Is He's got an average car, but when he gets his opportunities, he does maximise them. Look at this weekend. was I would have maybe expected him, considering Sprint Race 2, how many restarts there's four drivers had to go through. I am honest to God surprised he didn't bottle it, because I probably would have. I think, obviously, he kept his nose cleanly open in two corners, could have expected more in that situation because ultimately, as Lawson said, was it's survival is critical around the back of the streets, and that was what he needed to do. Yeah, it's difficult. He, uh, I think he'll be happy with that, and it's the second time he's done that as well. He's done in Bahrain, mm-hmm. so very good effort from him. Uh, Matteo Nannini obviously returned to the series uh, after uh, presumably finding funding. Obviously, he's he's in at Campos now. He replaced Jean Luc Petakov at Campos. Uh, a solid weekend for him, Jim. Uh, he'll be happy with that. If uh, bearing in mind that's his his first weekend uh, in in the Campos car, no P11. Yeah, uh, a solid weekend. I think he'd be happy just to be there really after what is a very topsy-turvy season but it's almost very Formula 2 to have this roundabout of of drivers but the quick return was something that surprised us and with the funding I don't know I don't know what the situation is and maybe I just haven't researched enough I don't know if he's doing the full season or or what now after the the Petikoff issues and aching back as well these drivers that aren't scoring a lot of the points and down at the bottom end of the championship they almost flipping and flopping and see how they turn up at the end of the season but yeah great great to see him back he's going to be racing in formula formula three um so i never felt too bad for the guy he's seems like a nice like seems like a nice kid and glad to see him racing difficult with the was it the feature race when he couldn't start in the end um <laughs> an awful lot of fluid um, run out the back of his car. which That didn't looked, look good, did it? <laughs> that looked like the sort of uh, super evil green that you'd get in some sort of uh, comic book movie. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, happy to see him back. And we'll see how the season goes. Um, just the big thing for me is don't, don't uh, show up my Ralphie. That, that's, a, that's a no-no, Matthias. So I don't do that. Of course. Harsh on Petikoff to only give him two races? Uh, he hasn't shown me anything thus far, but maybe it's the car that said, yeah, let's just skip a series and do that massive jump up. Is You'll get a Verstappen every now and again who can do that. And I never saw anything in Petikoff that said, yeah, I can do that. Great. Yeah, go, go and win um, F4 and people are going to give you a round of applause. And yeah, uh, terrific. Or I don't know. Skipping F three is the right decision. Um, Maybe he'll end up in F three. Now, now we we know how much the uh, the driver merry go round is. Uh, yeah, maybe he'll end up in F three. Who knows? Yes, yeah. yeah, that and that could be that could be saving grace really. But it's an expensive sport, like we know. So maybe the reason why he had to go to F two now was for financial reasons. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I seems like a nice guy as well. Seems quick. Clearly, he's quick. Um, but without the Ferrari side of things, I, I don't know where I don't know what happens at this point. I'll keep an eye out for him, and it'd be 
a shame if he falls by the wayside, but how many other drivers can you say that about? So it, it's not a unique situation if he falls off the radar from now on. It's unfortunate, um, but I don't feel more sympathy for him than any other drivers who fall off the radar. Doing the big jump and skipping Formula 3 is a risk, and it's a risk that didn't pay off at this point. Yeah, we'll see. No, in Formula 2, he'll we'll be back next race. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Now, question time for our panel. Uh, as always, we want to give you guys the opportunity to ask any questions that you may have through the weekend. So if you're sat at home and you're thinking, oh, I had a question from Sprint Race 1, Sprint Race 2, whatever it may be, get in contact. Get in contact with us on social media. Message us on Instagram, tweet us, or whatever you may, whatever you use, really. Uh, so first question at Luke underscore buckle 12 on Instagram asks, is Yuri Vip a title contender, Jim? We've already kind of answered that, but I'll add to that. Is he uh, in with a shot at a Formula One seat next season? Uh, has he got anywhere to go if you've got Yuki Sonoda performing well? Um, and, you know, you've got Pierre Gasly, who is, yeah, is, is Formula One realistic opportunity for next season? Difficult to say at this point, just because I don't know how... Alpha Tauri, who is going to be the way through, are going to handle the drivers that they've got. Um, Sonoda could drop out. We don't know. Uh, he's done well this weekend. He's great at Bahrain and done very mediocre in between. So he could do a, he could be a straight swap. Out you go, Yuki, and in you come Yuri. Uh, I would say, though, at this point, yeah, championship contender. He's doesn't even have to win it, really, to prove that he would deserve another season in Formula 2 and we've got to remember this is his first full season um, he clearly showed you had talent in the brief uh, cameo he had last year and as we've seen this weekend he's got an awful lot of talent so he could be a championship contender but I don't think he has to win the championship in order to potentially get into Formula 1 because I don't think next year has to be his season to do it um, mentioned again Jayan Daruvala. I think this is a year he has to do it if he's going to make a jump into F1. Um, but Phipps has almost a bit of the the fortune that he doesn't have to do it this year. But yeah, I, I, I could imagine him being in the top five by the end of the season. Um, and if he has another weekend like this, he'll be the winner. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Hannah, we'll come to you for this one. So at OOR and underscore Elite Alex uh, on Twitter said that his driver of the day was Felipe Drogovic. Uh, kind of went a little bit unnoticed. P11 to P4 in today's feature race. Uh, you know, it's quite, quite, quite the drive that kind of, again, went under the radar, didn't it? Absolutely. I think Felipe's had one of them weird situations. Is obviously same kind of as you and Callum I lot last year was his teammates obviously doing so well. His kind of strong performances are flying under the radar I think they don't necessarily get the tension they always deserve I think looking at that feature race I think of all the drivers he made up the most positions I've ever obviously apologize where the penalties ended up going further back than fighting their way through but overall he did have an incredibly solid race and I think it proves why he should have been to be honest picked up by a driver academy I don't see why he wasn't yeah great drive from him LA who was your driver of the weekend this weekend <laughs> I, I honestly I've got to, I've got to say Dan I do because of the way it just kept coming back I mean I've obviously got my, my finger over him at the minute you know I'm watching everything he's doing um you know I do think Vips was incredible with that double don't get me wrong absolutely um but you know was he challenged in in ways that Dan was challenged uh, no you know and, and I'm not sure that any driver was that didn't actually have to retire um, and um, I like to, we all like a journey, you know, these TV shows we watch, they're all social experiments of people that go and live in houses for a couple of months and we sit and watch them at home. And it, it's all about um, human development and personal development. And with Formula 2, I kind of feel like it's a bit more fly on the wall. We, we, we just see it's all warts and all. We see everything. We hear everything. And, you know, we're watching um, these young men develop into potential Formula One stars and champions. And, um, I, yes, the double absolutely was an incredible achievement. Um, but I do think Dan has shown such 
character development this weekend that I'm giving it to him um not just because of all those overtakes and doubles and overtaking where he has no right to be overtaking but the driving skills to keep it on the track himself and um yeah it's him Perfect. Now, a quick word on our Formula 2 graduates in Formula 1 this weekend. Yuki Tsunoda, P7 today, uh, when we're recording on Sunday, obviously. Uh, great weekend for him, Jim. Yeah, uh, I alluded to earlier, he's had a really good start. He had middling races and errors and that crash in uh, Imola. Embarrassing, but a wet, a wet track for one of these graduates who saw Schumacher very lucky as well that race um so he's had a tough old time but it's almost like we've gone back into the pre-season testing when all of a sudden this Alpha Tower looked like there could be a championship contender <laughs> it's how quickly Formula One changes that I remember at Barcelona everyone thinking god that Alpha Tower is a rocket and Gasly is doing a Gasly. He's, if you talk about graduates from F2, Gasly is almost the star of the show at the moment. Um, but yeah, the uh, Alpha Tower is doing very well. And Sonoda this weekend, just apart from, we talk about the funny radio messages, apart from his shut up message uh, early on in the race, he's uh, which was which was great. And because of so much other things that have happened, that's almost lost its meme potential. But he did exactly what he needed to do. He kept out of trouble. And we've seen from, you know, somebody who's all right, like Lewis Hamilton, if you uh, get into trouble at Baku, it's going to, at Baku, like a dog, at Baku, that it's going to bite you like a dog. And <laughs> I see what I did there, deliberate. Nice, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I Sonoda did exactly what he needed to. And these are the kind of performances that he's going to need to have if he's going to maintain that seat because let's not forget there's no guarantee that he will have a second season in in Formula One next year there's no guarantee he'll have one season in Formula One in a Red Bull Driver Academy <laughs> so. precisely precisely you Bips gets a call up out of nowhere who knows but <laughs> he needs to have more of these races in order to continue his presence in Formula One which on judgment of today on Sunday on race day he deserves on judgment of the past few races not so certain i think the interesting factor is obviously between so the last couple of rounds and this round is that he's actually moved to italy he now lives by the alpha tower facilities and i think that's maybe the difference is some pundits were saying was obviously at the beginning of the year he was maybe relying on his talent for formula two whereas say if you look at for example mick schumacher he came in and spent all as the day same as sebastian vettel when he was at toro Rosso was he was always, they always used to joke he was the first to enter and the last to leave. He would be there before the mechanics, putting that work in. And Snowd has been doing the same now, putting the hours in at the simulator, understanding that car. And it does show, and I think that creates an interesting dynamic for him, is we don't know what will happen with Gasly. I think Red Bull are committed for Snowd for at least another season because they know sometimes moving a driver up or down after one season isn't always the fairest assessment now. And so... I think if he has performances like that and continues to grow in confidence, I reckon he could challenge Gasly because we all saw last year is he does have the talent. When he's got that pace, he's like a pocket rocket. He just goes for it. He's rapid, isn't he? And yeah, he spent all week at the Alpha Tower factory, isn't he? So hopefully that's working for him, which is which is good. And Hannah Mick Schumacher, P13 today. Uh, best finish so far in Formula 1? Yeah, I think it's a weird one because obviously in P13, oh, it's a good finish. And then you realise he's actually above George Russell, Nicholas TV, and Nikita Mazepin in the championship standings, which hmm. proves that old adage is when you're at the back, all you need to do is survive. Yeah, the real talent is there, isn't it? And, and LA, Nikita Mazepin, I mean, he finished ahead of a seven-time world champion today, Lewis Hamilton, didn't he? Uh, some good progress on his behalf. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he finished um, in 14th today ahead of Lewis Hamilton and Latifi, um, who, you know, is a graduate himself of Formula Two. Um, so, you know, I've, I still admire any of these guys that go up into Formula 
Formula One. You know, can we can we not look back a little bit and remember Roman Grosjean when he first went into Formula One and he got into quite a lot of trouble for not just one season, but for a few seasons until he settled down, until he found his rhythm and he found his flow. But he's been involved in some horrific crashes, you know, over the years in Formula One. Um, and I don't I'm not referring to Bahrain, you know, I mean, initially when when he was a rookie and then, you know, yeah, a couple of years after. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, look back, you know, look back, not these graduates don't go in absolute perfection. You know, the, these graduates are still learning and, and they're still learning. Drivers make mistakes all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And that's it for today. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Hannah, Jim, LA, thank you so much for your company on today's show. Uh, and thank you to you guys at home as well. If you want to get involved in the conversation, you can, of course, join our community on Discord. You can join us on social media, follow us on Instagram, on Twitter. All of the links to those are either down below or they're also on our website, www.insidef2.com, and they're in the header. Uh, let us know what you think of the show in the comments. If you liked it, of course, make sure you give it a like uh, and subscribe to our channel. But from me, Fraser Ford, and all of us here at Inside F2, we'll see you next time.